All right, all right. Yikes. All right. Wow, that's very enthusiastic. All right. Has anybody ever seen that movie before? Okay. Anybody know what movie is it? Independence Day, yeah, absolutely, Independence Day. Now, that was the original, that was the OG Independence Day, okay? That was not the remake that was, happened a couple years ago that apparently stunk that I didn't even see, okay? All right, well, thank you all so much for coming. We're glad you're here. I uh, hope school year is going well, right? So, we, in the U.S., we talk a lot about freedom, right? We just saw Independence Day, right? We celebrate Independence Day every 4th of July. We have our Bill of Rights in our Constitution, uh, you all don't have your driver's license yet, but I'm sure that's, you know, a topic of conversation of what you're going to do when you get your li- license, right? All the freedom that comes from being able to drive yourself everywhere, right? But the one thing we don't really talk much about is how we find our freedom, right? So as I was preparing for this teaching, I came across a TED Talk on how to find freedom. So naturally, I was interested. So those of you who never heard of TED Talks before, they're basically just a conference Right? That's hosted annually, and this per, you know, speakers come from all over the place, and they share their different ideas and research on a whole wide range of topics, typically through telling a story. So I found this lady, her name is Natalie Sisson, who was sharing her personal experience of how she found freedom. She explains that after she graduated college, she began working her way up the corporate ladder to where she had a whole rack of people under her, and she was making some really good money. But she also realizes that it took her 45 minutes to get to work, which meant that she was wasting an hour and a half every single day driving back and forth to work. And so she quits because she couldn't live with the fact that she was wasting all that time and feeling that she wasn't in control of her own freedom. So then she goes to explain that she hops around from company to company um, and then still realizing that she's still not in control of her own freedom. So eventually she creates her own company. She creates her own company, and then that enabled her to work remotely wherever in the world that she wanted to go. And in her mind, at that moment, she has finally found freedom, right? She can be anywhere she wants, log into her work whenever she wants, and then she was finally free. And she concludes her message with the thought that each one of us have our own individual interpretation of freedom. All right, so freedom to, freedom to her was having the flexibility to work remotely, right, creating her own hours from wherever in the world that she wants to go. But somebody else might be like, man, that sounds awful. Why in the world would I want to travel all the way around the the world just to log into work? Or maybe you all. Maybe some of you all play soccer. Maybe some of you all play soccer, and some of you, that's your freedom, right? Running up and down the soccer field, uh, trying to score a goal as fast as you can. Whereas others of you is like, man, that sounds like the worst possible way to spend a weekday afternoon. Why in the world would I want to? I'm just tired just even thinking about running up and down the field. So I get it. And so I don't necessarily disagree with her point. I believe everyone should find their, find their passions and, what pursues, and pursue what excites them because those are God-given. It's the way that each of us were created as individuals. However, the Bible actually says that we find true freedom just a little bit differently. Let's check out John 8, 32. It says, Jesus, this is Jesus talking. He says, then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Okay? So Jesus says that true freedom actually comes from knowing the truth. Well, how do you find the truth? How do you find the truth, and, and you know, what is the truth? Well, that answer actually comes from the previous verse in verse 31. Let's check that out. So Jesus says, you're truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings, and then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So since Jesus' teachings are all captured in the Bible, basically what he's saying is you should read and study the Bible to know truth, right? And as Jesus says, once we learn the truth, that's where we gain freedom from our sin and the shame that comes with it. So how do we read and study the Bible? Well, first, you need to find a Bible that fits you. And I got to admit, there's so many different versions and translations. I got to tell you, if you ask five different people, you're going to get five different answers on which version you should read. Uh, This is, we actually have a translation scale, and this is actually just some of the translations. There's many more than this. Uh, But remember that the original Bible was written in Greek and Hebrew, right? Greek and Hebrew. And so both of those had to be translated into English. 
And so on the one side here, on the far left, you have a word-for-word -word translation, all right? And then on the other side, you have a thought-for-thought -thought and then even a paraphrase, which goes even further. Uh, and so the idea is that when these translators were translating the Bible, when you try to do a word-for-word -word translation, it was hard to, you know, some words just didn't translate well, and, you know, you might have had some slang that, like, you know, we all use slang today. Well, they had slang back then. And so sometimes it just... It just reads better if you had a thought-for-thought -thought translation instead of word-for-word. -word. And so all the way on the left, you have your NASB. That's your New American Standard. That is probably the most word-for-word -word translation you can get. It literally takes the Greek and Hebrew and just, bam, here's the English translation right there. Then as you move further to the right, you have your ESV. A lot of people, a lot of people uh, read that one, the English Standard. Uh, then there's the, like the NIV. NIV is really popular. That's the one we throw up on Sundays on the screens. Uh, we actually give the NIV away back in the back there, so please, if you don't have a Bible, go ahead and grab one. Uh, and it's just like, a, like this middle ground. It's a nice, a nice even Stephen kind of place, uh, the NIV. Uh, personally, I actually like the New Living Translation. That goes just a little bit further. That's the NLT. That goes a little bit further into the thought for thought. And I just love it because it's easy. The easy it's really easy to understand. It's written 21st century language and thought, and it's, it's my go-to translation. When I need, actually, that's my go-to in translation, whether if I need extra help or not, <laughs> I, that's the one I always go to. Um, and then all the way on the right, you have the message translation, and actually, that's actually more of a paraphrase of the Bible, and it's, it was actually written more like a story um, than it was, it, which makes it even easier to understand. So, my advice to you is to look at a few different translations and see which one you like the best. But really, whichever one you have lying around your house is perfectly fine. You just have to read it. So, you got your translation you like. Now, where do you start? Well, in three weeks, we're actually going to be starting a brand new series in the Second Peter, which is a great place to start because it's only three chapters. It's a really short book. And First and Second Peter, they're some of my favorite books of the Bible. I mean, Peter was one of the 12 disciples. He was one of Jesus' closest friends, and he spent several years of his life following him wherever he went. So naturally, Peter just instinctively gained a whole lot of wisdom hanging around Jesus that he passes on to us, which is really cool. Um, if you're, you're not ready to wait for us to get to 2 Peter, another good place to start is in the Psalms. I would recommend reading through the Psalms or reading through the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Right there in the very front of the New Testament, which is the second half of the Bible. Uh, and they're the four different accounts of Jesus' ministry on earth. All right. So you got your translation. You got your place to start in the Bible. Now, you need to decide when you can devote some time to actually read the Bible. And ideally, you're going to want to read a little bit every day. But if, at least if you could just read a few times a week, that's a great start. That's a great start. Most people are going to say that reading first thing in the morning is the best because you start your day off first thing in the, uh, with the morning, reading the Word, and you get to think about what you read throughout the day. And believe me, that's great. That is absolutely true. However, I am not a morning person. I can't do mornings. I've tried reading in the morning. I just can't do it. I get up, and I barely have enough time to go to the bathroom before my kids are rushing in, asking me a gazillion questions about and different things that they want me to do that day. So I found personally that reading just before bed, that's the time that works best for me. House is quiet, everyone's in bed, and I can spend some quality one-on-one -on -one time with my Heavenly Father. And I got to tell you, when I miss more than one or two nights of reading, something just starts to feel a little off. Like something just isn't quite right. It's not until I reconnect with God through reading His Word that I begin to feel restored and renewed. But really, the most important thing is to connect with God through reading the Bible regularly. So when you're able to read it at the same time every day, you begin to develop a habit. You develop a routine. And routines are great because they are things that we do almost instinctively, automatically. There's actually also something called habit stacking, where you tack on a new habit to one you already have. Let me give you an example. Let's say you get home from school, you grab a snack, and then you read the Bible for five minutes. And, that, and what happens is uh, the more specific you are when you, with your habits, the more likely you are to stick to them. It's also a great idea to read through the Bible with a friend because sometimes 
the Bible can be a little tricky, right? I'm sure we've all come across some tricky passages, right? It's a little hard to understand. So pick a book of the Bible, read a chapter together with a friend, download the YouVersion Bible app, and you can go through the Bible plan, or the Bible reading plan with a friend. There's also some other great Bible apps. We have a whole bunch up here. Uh, the next one is, I want to highlight this Read Scripture app. It's the second one in. That one's actually really cool because it, it breaks it down to different chunks of the Bible. And what's cool is it actually gives you a video from the Bible Project, which is uh, the one on the left there. Uh, we've shown some of those videos here in Peak Youth and in the park. Um, Bible Project just puts together, it's two guys. They basically created this whole list of videos. And they're great because they give you great context. And they can really just help you understand with what you're reading. Uh, one other thing is we actually also have devotionals, which are on these back uh, two red racks back there with the Bibles. Uh, so please go ahead and check those out. They're free. Uh, we have a bunch back there. Please, if you find one that you'd like, go ahead and take it home with you. Look through it. Um, there's some devotions back there, and there's also some journals that you can uh, take notes with as well. Uh, so those are just, uh, just great, great resources to have while you're reading the Bible. Um, and they're just, they're just great resources to help you read in your daily reading of the Bible. You can use them to just bounce ideas off of each other, like, like it says in Proverbs. As iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens another friend. So the two of you can share ideas that each other you have, how God has been moving in your life and what God's been teaching you. Do you see, the Bible is God's living word, which means that even though it was written so long ago, it's alive. It's alive, and God uses it to speak to us and change us every single day. Lastly, when you come across a passage that's hard to understand, context becomes really important, right? I mean, things like when the book was written, who the author was, who the book was written for, they all play a major part in understanding the context of the book. Some study Bibles actually include that kind of information in the book, which is also really handy. It's really important to take the whole passage in its context rather than singling out just a couple individual verses. Tell you what, to show you how important that is, we're going to look at a couple verses that are commonly taken out of context. And I'm going to ask you what you think they mean, then give you the context behind them. All right. Let's check out the first one. Jeremiah 29, 11. Who wants to read that for us? Who wants to read that for us? Cool, right here. Perfect. Go ahead. Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declared this is the Lord for plans to prosper and you and not harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. All right, perfect. Now, if you were just reading that verse, like on a refrigerator or something, what would you think that means? What do you think? I would, like, think it means, like, oh, so the Lord, like, knows what's going to happen for you and all that. Okay, all right. Okay, that's actually good. That's good. All right. Let's give him a round of applause. Nice job. Nice job. <laughs> All right. So actually, so yeah, so this verse actually, you'd probably see it on refrigerators and, you know, hanging up in, in houses and stuff like that. And that's fine. That's fine. But the thing is that this verse a lot of times gets takes out, taken out of context. Like, uh, like if we do, you know, that God has, all, has a plan for us and he's going to prosper us, right? He's going to give us lots of money, a really cool house and, lot, you know, great job, vacations, all the whole nine, right? Well, not necessarily. Not necessarily. This, see, this verse was actually written to a group of people, the Israelites, to a specific time in the Bible. They were captured by the Babylonians. And so God's saying, look, I know times are hard right now, but don't worry. I got you. I, got, I, I have a plan for you, and I will see you through this. Basically, what God's saying is, God, he's saying, guys, I want you to put your faith in me. And he gives, and that's, that's what he's trying to tell us, that we should put our faith in God. All right, we have one, another one. Matthew 7. Who wants to read this one? All right, all right. In the back. All right, what do we got right here? Matthew 7. For I know the plans I have for you, declares. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Uh, sorry. Uh, next one. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. Okay, now, if you were just to see that like a Google search, what would you think that means? I thought, like, karma almost. Okay, pretty self-explanatory. All right. Okay, cool. Yeah. And so, uh, great job. Let's give her a round of applause. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So 
So yeah, so that is actually probably one of the most Googled verses in the Bible, right? It's almost like this thing where it's like, hey, look, you do you, I'm going to do me. I, let's just, you know, we'll keep ourselves separated. Like, I'm not going to worry about what you're doing. I'm just going to do myself. Uh, we're not going to get in your business. You don't get in my business, okay? But that's actually not what this verse is saying. Because what you do, what, when you come across a verse that you don't necessarily understand, you use other verses in the Bible to help bring clarity. And so in the Bible, I mean, you get verses like in Galatians where it says, you know, we carry each other's burdens. And so really what we're supposed to be doing is we're not supposed to be just, you know, leaving people to their sin and just leaving them alone. But no, rather than come alongside them and say, hey, you know, how can I help you through this? How can I pray for you? How can we get through this together? And you come along through, come alongside them with love and, and, and it gets a little messy, but, but sometimes it's, it's great to be able to pour into somebody like that, okay? All right, last one, last one. Philippians 4.13, classic, classic verse. Perfect, right here. What do you think? I can do all things through Christ. I can do all things through him who strengthens, who gives me strength. Yeah, you got it, you got it, yeah, okay. Now, when you see that verse, what do you think? What do you think? Just if you were just to read just that only verse, what would you think? That... God's strength gives me the power to do almost everything that um, he has pre- prepared me to do. There it is. Good. Nice job. Nice job. Give a round of, give a round of applause. Nice job. So that's it. That, you nailed it at the end. So, um, and so that's the thing. Like When I, people see this verse, they're like, oh, man, I'm going to go join the NBA because, look, I got Jesus on my team, man. I'm good to go. But that's not the case. That's not the case. He's, so what actually... Paul is actually writing the the book of Philippians when he's in prison. He's in prison, and he's saying, look, whether I'm free or I'm in jail, whether I have a lot or I have nothing, I'm going to follow God because God has brought me to where I'm at right now, and God's going to see me through that. He's going to see me through the hard times being in prison, and he's going to strengthen me even though where I am right now. Nice job. Nice job. All right. One last thing that, that can help with reading and studying your Bible is to always ask yourself three questions. We got them right here. Does this passage teach me about God? What does this passage teach me about God? What does this, teach, what does this passage teach me about human beings? And what does God want me to do now? These are great questions that you can just, when you read a passage, use them to kind of think through it a little bit, to, to get some application of what God's actually saying in that verse. So, Bottom line is, regardless of what Bible you choose, the most important thing is to read it, right? Of course. Read it regularly. And Psalm 1, 1 through 3 says this. It says, Oh, the joys of those who do not follow evil men's advice, who do not hang around with sinners, scoffing at the things of God, but they delight in doing everything God wants them to do. And day and night are always meditating on his laws and thinking about ways to follow him more closely. They're like trees along the riverbank bearing luscious fruit each season without fail. Their leaves shall never wither and all they do shall prosper. That's actually the, that's actually the living Bible back behind us. Uh, And man, what an amazing promise. What an amazing promise by God. I don't know if any of you have have ever noticed uh, the emblem that's on the the outside of the, the church, like the little circle thing with the tree and like the little circle around it. That actually comes from this verse. That comes from this verse. With the, and the idea being that when you're firmly in God's word, right, when you're reading the Bible regularly, we're like a tree that's constantly being fed and, and just giving, getting nutrients from, that, from the, his word, and we're able to bear fruit. Like, good things happen when we do that. And it's, it's just an amazing verse, an amazing promise that God, that God makes us. All right. Before we pray and head out to group, just one reminder. Uh, do we have journey next week? No, absolutely. Yeah, all right, perfect. <laughs> okay, no reminder necessary. Perfect. All right. Uh, and also, one last thing before we close. Uh, remember, we're going to come back the week after next, and we got flame journey, flame bonfire journey, right, on October 19th. Uh, it's going to be out in Summit Park. It's going to be awesome. We'd love to see you and some friends that you're going to invite. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Cool. All right. Yeah. So, uh, love to see you there. Uh, It's going to be a great night, and I'm really looking forward to it. 
All right, let's pray. Dear God, thank you so much for today. I thank you so much just for these teenagers and for their, their small group leaders, God, that come out every night. Um, God, it's cold out. It was, you know, it's kind of windy and rainy, God, and, but they're here, and we thank you so much for that, God. They could be anywhere else, um, and I just thank you so much that they're here. Um, God, I just pray just for tonight. I pray for group time. I pray that um, you would just be in our midst, be in our conversations, um, God, and just help us to fit time in for your word, into our daily schedule, God. Uh, and God, I just, I know that, that that time with you is just so valuable, um, and I just pray that these, that these teens would realize just how important it is to read their Bible. We love you, God. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.